All right. Welcome, everybody. This is the At One Challenge burning question session where the participant in At One Challenge can ask a language learning expert or experimenter um, a question, a question, the burning question when they're learning a language. And this month, oh, what is the At One Challenge? The At One Challenge is, is a community of people where we are um, aim for the goal of being able to hold a 15-minute conversation in 90 days together in the community. So 15-minute conversation in 90 days. Um, and um, so, yeah, so today we have our guest, Connor Grooms. He's the founder of Baselink. Yeah, we are good friends and um, we're, we're neighbors back in Chiang Mai, and, and he just started a company called Baselink, and he made a documentary. which was really, really awesome. He went from scratch to B1 in 30 days. So we're going to ask him how he did it and, and, and all that. So, Connor, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, glad to be here. Cool. All right. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself real quick? Um, I'm still here in Medellin. This is, this is home now. I was living as a nomad for about a year and a half before coming here. Um, never did. Well, I did one year of formal school. That's about it. Um, big proponent of self-education, of you know, sort of taking control of your own education, reading, travel, you know. And my sort of thing is doing things, learning things in a month. Cool. And how old are you? Twenty. This guy's 20. Get this. He, he's been traveling and, and living this nomad life. Since when? Uh, summer of 2014. So summer of 2014. Like, something like, yeah, 20 months. I don't know. Something like that. Like, <laughs> I remember first seeing him. He's like this like skinny kid. I'm like, what is he doing here? Man, what? he looks like you're 16 or something. <laughs> but now he's looking at him. He's... He's, he's grown, and he's a really smart kid, so I love spending time with him, hanging with him. So, all right, let's jump in the question. Let's get a question from uh, from people here. Troy, Hannah, or Evan, you all got a question for Connor? All right, yeah, I do have a question. Um, I am about to pick up Icelandic from complete scratch in February with the challenge there. And I'm curious, uh, how did you manage to do from scratch to be one with Spanish in a month and not even giving yourself a complete 90 days? Um, all right, so the first thing I want to like, talk about is it's not like the weeks or the months. It's the hours. So if I had learned Spanish in, say, five months and done an hour a day, no one would have been like, oh, my God, that's amazing. But I did the same number of, like, hours, like roughly 150 hours is what I've found, at least for Spanish. I, I'm, I don't know how hard Icelandic is. Maybe it's 180 for Icelandic. Maybe it's 130. Um, but it's the number of hours you're putting in, as long as they're generally... Pretty, pretty close together if it, you're being consistent, not the number of weeks. So I did five or six hours a day mm -hmm. um, every day during my challenge. So that's how I learned so quickly is not, you know, beyond just using methods that are effective and, you know, not wasting time on, you know, cutting corners with grammar and focusing on communication and sort of those core principles. But at the basic level, it's just... I took the amount of time that you would spend over three months, and I squashed it down into one. Yeah. Yeah, and how, how did you manage to avoid uh, burnout? Because when I, there's a certain point that I realize I cannot, absolutely cannot fit anything more into my brain, no matter how much more time I may have left in the day to study. My brain just, just goes on strike. Do you ever deal with that? On a day-to-day... The, the way to tackle that is to spend most of your time speaking, which is ironically also the best way to learn, because if you actually want to speak, you just the only way to learn how to speak is to speak. Um, but on a macro scale, I, I didn't avoid burnout. After the month was over, I, I, didn't, I don't think I studied at all for two weeks, because uh, I was just like, exhausted. Um, but 
on a day-to-day, -day, yeah. If you spend your time speaking and you do like bits of grammar and bits of new stuff each day, there's really not to get to a, a B1 or a communicational, like conversational level. There's a lot of grammar you can cut out. So the, the amount of like quote unquote stuff that you have to learn is not as huge as people think. But you need to have like a very strong grasp on that small amount of stuff. So the the way I'd go about it is learn some new stuff each day, but spend the majority of your time just having conversations. Just yeah, talk for two hours, and that's not going to it'll it'll still fry your brain, but not quite as quickly as if you're like got your head in a grammar book. Mm. Yeah, I I agree. Cool. Um, grammar book was like the worst decision I've made, and made me quit on one line. So, so yeah. yeah, speaking is generally just absorbing it uh, throughout the day, just chatting, either typing or Skyping all day long, and that can be um, wound into everyday activities. Right. I always set off blocks as well of, like, one-on-one -on -one Skype conversations. That's yeah. very key because um, you want to be talking, not just typing, although the typing helps as well. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Awesome. I think it's great what Connor said. Because you say three months. Huh. Yeah, if you look at it, I spent three months on a language versus I spent 150 hours on a language or two different things. Because mm -hmm. three months, you could be spending like an hour a month. Mm -hmm. You know? If hours, exactly. you're actually talking about actionable hours, actually doing, you're actually studying. So, so it's not the matter of... of months or even years is about how many hours you actually put in the language. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're being consistent. Like if you do, yeah. you know, 100 hours today and then not anymore for a year or you, you know, have giant chunks of time you're going to forget everything in between. But if you're consistent, yeah, it's, it's all about hours put in, not necessarily weeks or months. Well, there's only, too bad there's only 24 hours a day. We can't put 100 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so let's let's get another question from 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 the from from, from the hangout. So okay. So uh, I had a question. I actually I did watch your documentary like a week ago. Um, it was really fascinating. Um, but I'm just curious. Um, one of the things that you mentioned on there was the mimic method. And I was mm -hmm. kind of curious to like have your opinion on that. I haven't really encountered that before. Um, okay. So it's just interesting to me, just in terms of the pronunciation, in terms of I mean the, the, the program itself or the general techniques of uh, you know using both. It. Okay. Um, so general techniques, absolutely. I definitely think training with sound in the beginning, and whether you do that with a recording or you have like a, a live feedback. So you want to. A, learn each sound. You need to have each sound down by itself. Um, and then the process of like recording yourself, saying that sound, comparing it to uh, a native speaker. You know, you do this on a sound level first, and then you could do it on a, on a word in a sentence level. Um, but you, there will be little differences between how you say it and how it's actually said that you can't quite notice until a native speaker points it out to you. So the usefulness of this is you get to you're tuning your ear to the language so you can hear the little difference, and then that is not just good for your pronunciation and like actually sounding local, which ironically is probably the best way for you to uh, not have people switch back to English, which is a lot of it's a giant problem for a lot of people. If you mm -hmm. actually speak in a clear accent, people won't switch back because they're, you know, it, it's more comfortable for them. Um, but it's going to make a huge improvements on your listening ability because you're going to be able to hear all these little differences in sounds. Mm -hmm. So you do that first on a sound level or individual sounds in the language. So you learn those, nail those, and then you start stringing those in together into words and sentences and do the same process. You basically, the song part is fun. That's what helps because you need to do lots of repetition to sort of drill it into yourself. But it's... Um, it's not about necessarily singing, it's just high repetition. So you can do this with sentences as long as you're getting tons of feedback on, say, okay, here you made this little mistake where your A is a little bit too closed, for instance, or mm -hmm. this R is 
whatever. I don't know which which language you're learning, but it's. Um, I'm actually doing Italian right now. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, you want to get that sort of feedback so you can hear as like, hey, l listen to the difference, and that sort of process will get you get you further along. And then the the last thing is just the slurring, because like in English when we say what are you doing tonight, like just like he said in the mm -hmm. video, versus right. what are you doing tonight, we sort of slur things together. So you want to bring up the speed and have people slurring stuff intentionally for you, so you sort of get used to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a quick question about, like, because when you put sound into, when you're speaking sound, per, like when you're speaking, it's when you, mm -hmm. at first when you're slurring together, when you're, it's like the tone is, is like different. Mm -hmm. How do you manage to, to, to do that? It's just an iterative process. I mean, it's, there's no like specific technique. You would, you want to get to being able to say it just normal first, um, and then when you spend a lot of time in conversations, you spend a lot of time listening and saying, speaking the language, you'll start to do it yourself. I found that's how it sort of happened with me in Spanish, where I, I will have to mentally slow down when I'm speaking Spanish to gringos, because I've I did all my speaking with natives, and now I'm slurring my stuff together. And I'll have to mentally slow it down for, for other learners. Oh, interesting. Cool. All right. So let's go into question with the other at one challenge participant. Um, let's see. How long and how did Connor plan to study and make this documentary? So studying and making this documentary at the same time. Um, how long did it take to plan this thing? Okay. So like the actual documentary part. I mean, I basically filmed myself throughout the entire process. Um, I probably had at least 100 hours of footage that I had to sort of cut out. Um, but I just filmed myself throughout the entire process, and then after it was done, I sat down and, and did the editing. And for every minute in the film, it was probably two or three hours of editing. So I would estimate it probably took me like 90 or 100 hours total of editing the film. So, I mean, it's time-consuming work just on an editing side, and I wanted to make sure that I both made it entertaining and, you know, hit all of these sort of language learning tips that I wanted to sort of include. Cool. All right, let's take another question in the Hangout. Who got a question? Yeah, unmute yourself first. My first Hangout. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for doing this. Um, I, I was amazed with the documentary. Um, so I, I want to know, uh, when you first decided to do this 30-day um, language learning, what were your expectations before you began? And did it change over the 30 days? Did, it, did you change your expectations or your or what your outcome was going to be? Um, so basically, like, I'm really terrible at doing a little bit every day. Like, for me, learning in a month is much easier, sort of mentally and approach-wise, versus learning, like, 30, 45 minutes a day. Um, so I'll start with that. It's just sort of, it's easier for me to just dive in for a month and go really hardcore and sort of reach a result and then sort of maintain that and slowly improve it from there. Um, but um, can we, can we restate the, the actual question again? I think I yeah, avoided what were your, when you When you decided this is what I'm going to do, what mm -hmm. were you thinking would happen at the end? Or did you know or did you, what was your, I guess, true desire? What, how much I mean, did you think? I mean, I sort of defined where I wanted to be, which was conversational. So... Mm -hmm where I could have conversations, normal, you know, like this, I could have this conversation in Spanish with someone who didn't speak English. Uh, maybe not quite this fluid, but I could get by with, you know, everyday stuff, like having friends, all of those things. I defined, like, what I wanted to be able to do, um, and I know the topics that I talk about, so I don't, I still can't talk about the weather very well because I never talk about the weather, but I can talk about business. Uh -huh. So, um, but I just defined exactly what I wanted to do, and then I just figured out, okay, what do I have to do every day to get to that point? 
-hmm. So I didn't really change my expectations too hard. If I started to fall behind where I wanted to be, I would just work yeah. harder. Yeah. I have one more question. Um, was there a tool or a, a study mechanism you were using that you figured at the end that you could have done without? Was there anything without? That, mm -hmm. um, so I was pretty ruthless even going in of like the stuff that I would include, which is basically the three things were speaking a ton, uh, Anki for just flashcards, and then pronunciation training. Um, I don't think any of those are disposable. I think if anything, I should have done even more speaking because that's you know by far the most important thing. Mm -hmm. With the, the teachers or with actual native uh, non-teachers. Doesn't matter. I mean, ideally, it's a teacher because they know how to, you know, sort of help you move along. They know what you, what you already know, so they can slowly push you. But if you if you don't have access to a teacher, then with with whoever you like, you can you want to learn stuff with a teacher, like mm -hmm. just normal conversation with a everyday person is not the ideal place because you don't want to stop in a normal conversation. Like, wait, can you explain that conjugation you just used? It's just sort of eh. yeah. slow. But everything. you can. But once you know something, you can practice you know, the stuff you already know with, with whoever. Okay. Thank you. Oh, all right. Let's see. Can you put your... <laughs> can you put yourself on mute, please? Thank you. All right. So let's go on a question from the email list. Everyone want you on the email list? Okay, let's see. How many words does Connor memorize in 30 days if he, t if he talks correctly or just using memorized sentence without language rules? Okay. Did you um, focus on the, yeah, go on. Yeah, I definitely did not memorize sentences. There are like a very small handful of phrases that I like memorized up front, like, como se dice, how do you say, que significa, like tiny little things that would help me with learning, but definitely was not memorizing whole sentences or entire phrases. I wanted the building blocks so that I could say anything. As for number of words that I learned, I don't know the exact number. I would estimate probably 1,500-ish, um, between 1,500 and 2,000, somewhere along there. I probably knew 1,500 and like heard and could sort of recognize and mm. you know, understand you know, on an additional couple hundred. All right, let's get in a question from the Anglin Chong participant. Um, what have you? Is this your first foreign language that you studied previously? If you if if you don't if this is um, if you study other languages before, how those um, experience influence your decision? What style of learning you take for Spanish? Um, okay, so I did three years of Mandarin Chinese in high school, which I remember almost nothing. So that really influenced how I went about things, um, and then I sort of like took a stab at French using Duolingo, and I sort of took a stab at Indonesian, you know, doing some vocabulary training. But, like, I never actually, like, committed to learning a language. I never actually, you know, did it. I never, like, like committed to actually learning it. Like, it was sort of just like a doop -a doop sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't really say any of those really influenced how I went about it. I just, I did a ton of research, a sort of new before I even started, like, because because I'm a learning nerd, just in the first place, I knew, like, basically everything you could know about how to learn a language without having actually learned a language. Um, so I just did a ton of research and determined, you know, what's going to be the fastest way, or the, what are the core pill pillars of what's the most important stuff, which was speaking, you know, SRS and pronunciation. And... And then just use that to sort of shape what what my program would look like for Spanish. All right, I see a question live here. Anybody got a question, Evan? Yeah, Evan, go. I ahead. was just uh, wondering, um, like after your month of learning Spanish, mm -hmm. um, how have you kind of maintained it, and do you think that you've reached like a greater understanding or fluency of Spanish? Yeah, absolutely. So after the challenge was done, I sort of, you know, derped for two weeks and didn't do anything. And I actually think I 
fell back a tiny bit in those two weeks, but you know, two two or three more days of like actual practice and it was all back. Um, but the useful thing is I live in Colombia. Uh, I stayed here after the documentary because I love it, um, and so I use it on a day to day basis. So I'm not doing very much formal studying, even in flashcards right now. But I am always improving, you know, just a little bit all the time, just because I use it all the time, you know, during the day for normal life. Um, so yes, I think my level is higher now than when I finished, but the film finished, you know, six months ago. So I would certainly hope that, you know, just by living in a country, you're going to improve your level. Is it, like, way, way better? Am I, like, properly fluent now where, you know, I am as good in Spanish as in English? Absolutely not. But I definitely have a, a more fluid, my accent's even better. Um, just using the language, you'll sort of improve it. But I haven't really pushed on making huge progress chunks since since the one month challenge. Mm. And I actually had a second question, which is yep. slightly unrelated to the language aspect, but I was just kind of curious mm. with your background, how you started your nomad uh, lifestyle. Like what inspired that? Can we do that in the last, at the end? Let's, sure. let's get over these, these language questions first, yeah? Um, Happy to answer that. All right, that's, yeah, so we do that last. Um, Okay, there's a really good question from one of the Ad One um, Challenge participants. Connor, so you said you're obsessed, you have an obsession of, of learning things in a month. Mm -hmm. What would be the principles of selecting the right materials and setting up the right routine for learning or accomplishing anything super fast? Okay, so I actually gave a, a talk about this uh, at TEDx Teen in London like two weeks ago. Um, and the core of it is you just do uh, a ton of research and you look at the people who've done things quickly, not necessarily like the typical places. So you just want to have a deep knowledge in whatever you're about to 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 tackle. So if it's fitness, you would want to look at okay, who are the people who are getting real results? You got to sort of put on your, your your bullshit filter and figure out you know what what are the people who know what they're talking about and what do they agree on, and make those your principles. Um, but on a, and then you just still don't have a plan of like what What's you're actually going to do. Okay, go on. Of what you're actually going to do day to day, um, because you can have like this end goal, but you need to have a process of what you're going to do each day. If you're just like I'm going to do X, but you don't know what you're going to do each day in and out to to get to X, uh, it's not going to happen. But the main thing is none of that shit actually matters unless you sort of make the entire project non-negotiable. Unless it's sort of, you, you are all in committed. So, like an example of something that's non-negotiable is you go to work every day. Like, you don't really have a choice of going to work or not. You know, you eat. You don't have a choice of not eating. Um, these are things that just happen because they have to happen. There's no choice of not them not happening. So you have to sort of uh, you know, mind fuck yourself into making whatever your your goal is, where you, where it's literally not even in the cards to not study, you know, your language for two hours a day, or I'm going to do an hour of speaking with the teacher and then another thirty minutes of flashcard training every day, and you have to literally make that priority, whereas it doesn't even register in your head that you would not do that. So you define what your process is based on that research, but you just have to have that very, very deep, non-negotiable commitment to just the process each day. And that's sort of why you, you have to focus on one thing at a time. Like if you try to learn three languages at a time or you try to lose 50 pounds and learn a language and start a business at the same time, none of those are going to happen. So for everyone here in the Ad One Challenge right now, that's very clearly your your number one thing right now outside of your normal everyday life is uh, learning whatever language you're learning. So you just got to make that your sort of non-negotiable outside thing of I'm going to spend X amount of time and I'm going to do X each day. And so that's sort of the only the only way to really really do it. Cool. What what helped you to to actually make that non-negotiable? Because people know that, but they don't actually do it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Well, people can... Just, we fool ourselves into thinking this stuff is non-negotiable, but there's, like, a, another step of, like, where it's actually non-negotiable. It's, like, when you, it's late, when you're tired, when you don't feel like it, when you've got other things that you have to do as well, that's when you see what, what in your life is actually non-negotiable. So, mm -hmm. like, when I was gaining weight, I would stand in the kitchen every night at 10.30 with a 1,200-calorie shake, and I was still full from dinner. And... I didn't want to freaking drink it. Like, the, the taste towards the end made me gag. I mean, you know that, Brian. <laughs> I, still can't drink, I still can't drink peanut butter. But every night I would drink it. Oh, man. Same thing with Spanish. Is like I hadn't done my pronunciation training some nights until, like, 2, 3 in the morning, and I did it. You just sort of have to define it as this is not something I'm willing to budge on, and you just, you just make, make yourself execute. Um, but if it's a, sort of an extreme goal, like I had, there's a point where you can't maintain that for too terribly long. So mm. you make something non-negotiable long-term, like, for instance, eating healthy, then it can't be as crazy as, like, three hours of, four, four or five hours of, you know, learning Spanish a day. That's not negotiable long-term. You'll burn out. But one yeah. hour a day is definitely possible long-term. Yeah. I think it's really good that what you point out, define what is... Non, what does non-negotiable mean? And then put that whatever you're committed to learning to to become non-negotiable because that's what really is. You know, if you put in that non-negotiable hours and the time that like that we talked about, 150 hours that you put in, mm -hmm. what you do, you focus on a few things, you get results if you do it exactly. Exactly, um, and that's one thing other people people do is they'll change their plan halfway through. I like almost never change my plans through the challenges. I define, I do my research before I am like, okay, this is the most effective way to do it, and then I do it. Because uh, if you change stuff too much during the middle of the challenge, you could be doing it just because you're lazy. Like, oh, I, this one's, you're mentally in your head, you could be, you know, mm. thinking that this thing is hard, this thing is easy, I should do more of this other thing. Mm. Or you could trick your, trick, your mind will trick you out of doing the hard but effective stuff. So totally. you sort of define what you're going to do, and then you just do that. Don't let yourself adapt. Totally. And um, did the accountability work for you? Having to pay me 500 bucks if you don't do it? Yeah, that, that sort of had a nice kick in <laughs> <laughs> Um Yeah, how'd you spend that 500 bucks, by oh, the way? It was good, it was good, it was good. On, on good things, on good things. <laughs> so Connor didn't study for a day, so he, he paid me 500 bucks. So, but each day you miss, you gotta pay me five hundred. So you only miss one day. So, that's pretty yeah. good. I, I was hoping that you miss more days, to be honest. But <laughs> I probably would have if that if that was not in place. <laughs> See, it works. So it works. We, we created. Yeah, it works. Doesn't need to be five hundred. It just needs to be something that hurts really bad. Like yeah. I definitely should not have had it that high. That was I made it that high for drama purposes for the film, but I, I definitely cannot afford five hundred dollars a day. <laughs> so ironically, you know, helps you actually do it. So Yeah. Cool. All right, let's take another question live. I have one All right. actually. Um, I want to know in terms of such a condensed learning. Um, mm -hmm. There's, uh, like, I can see wh where you're going to live somewhere afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, or if you're in that environment at that point, where mm -hmm. it would be extremely beneficial and there wouldn't be any much of a loss of knowledge uh, when, once you're done that burst of learning. Uh, mm -hmm. But how about when someone is learning a language and is not immersed in that environment and is probably put it, like, putting uh, all the extra effort there, probably more than is... Uh, that can be maintained long term, um, but yet won't have any occasions to use that outside in their daily life. Like, is 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 there? Would it be better to, like, it, would slowing down actually improve uh, the the knowledge retention, or it would just it would just kind of delay delay it just by making the project longer? There's there's two schools of thought here. There's two ways to go about it. Is one is you can sort of learn at like an hour and a half, an hour a day, and learn it over a longer period of time. And that longer period of time means you're less likely to forget stuff. Or you can do the burst method, which is what I did, and so it's sort of, it just comes down to what works better for you. Um, mm -hmm. You can do the burst method, and then once you have that body of knowledge, it takes 
you still need to maintain it, but it takes very little to maintain it. So you could spend, you know, a burst for a month or two months and then spend 15 minutes a day maintaining that, or you could spend an hour a day over a similarly long period of time. So my preference is definitely the burst and maintain, um, but it depends on the person and whether you're good at intense focus or if you're better at long-term habit. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right. Let's see. Um, I think... So were you working full-time, Connor, while you're doing this five, six hours a day thing? Uh, uh, I wouldn't really call it full-time, but I was definitely working part-time. Um, it did sort of screw things a bit because I had some nightmares with clients. Um, that's what sort of caused those late nights. Um, I'd probably say I was working between five and six hours a day, um, probably four or five days a week. So not quite full time, but definitely, mm -hmm. definitely was not just learning Spanish. But luckily, the work I was doing is sort of is design work, which is sort of I've been doing that a long time. It didn't take sort of just a, a nice mental switch, so it doesn't sort of interrupt, didn't make my brain hurt more, so to speak. All right, let's see. Omar, do you have a question? You need to unmute yourself first. Omar? Question? No? Okay. All right, so let's go back to Evan's question. Let's wrap this up. So how did you become a nomad, digital nomad? Um, so most people's stories with this start with, I went to the normal path, and then after college, I got a normal job, and then I hated it, and I'm like, there has to be another way, and then they read four-hour work week, and they sort of make it happen. That is, that, that's not my story at all. <laughs> um, my, both my parents are entrepreneurs, and we traveled a lot as a family. We sort of made that our priority. So I sort of grew up sort of with that. Mm -hmm. And it's not really surprising that, you know, even when I went to college, I knew I'm, I'm not going to finish this. Because that sort of autodidact, sort of self-taught thing is, is me. But the sort of entrepreneur and travel thing, uh, I was sort of raised in that manner. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was just I, that's the lifestyle I knew I wanted, and I busted my ass to sort of work work towards achieving that lifestyle. So as, as far as the mechanics of like how I did it financially is just uh, I got really good at one particular skill, which for me was web and software design, and then built up a client base doing that. And you know I had met like any of those clients in person. Um, and that's what funded, you know, baseline. Um, so that's what I'm doing full time now. Yeah, got it. Well I mean you so you, Connor is the one who did the At One Challenge website, by the way, just so you know. That was uh, I don't know, that was over over a year ago. Yeah, yeah. Looking good. Looking good. Okay, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about baseline. Cool. What's doing there? Um, so the um, basically we offer unlimited Spanish tutoring for 100 bucks a month. All the teachers have, you know, the sort of standard six-year degrees in teaching both English and Spanish, so they can sort of explain things at a high level. Uh, there's one of the questions in there was, are they Delhi trained? Uh, D E L E. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Um, yeah. The reality is, I sort of talked to all of our teachers and and everything about this, and the uh, the difference is we, we teach for real life usefulness versus test prep and they say that it's very often it's like a different curriculum if you're going for actual communication power versus the test. Um, so while they don't have like a Delhi degree, so to speak, I don't know if that even exists, uh, we are actively building materials for people who you know, want to pass that test. Um, but we've got teachers available from 6 a.m. till midnight Eastern, and they all sort of follow. I mean, if you agree with the principles in the documentary and you are learning Spanish, um, we've basically baked all of that into the curriculum of basically 80 20 cutting out the irrelevant stuff um, and making the curriculum very optimized. Um, and 
teaching you the things that you actually need versus, you know, armadillo is eating, you know, chocolate chip cookies. Like, uh, a lot of, you know, programs will teach you things you don't need. So, um, right now, I, I think you said we have three or four of the Add One Challengers already already in it? Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. People are talking about it. That's why I'm asking you to, to have a, have a okay. conversation. <laughs> So um, I can take questions from anyone um, about it while, while I'm talking about it, but uh, the biggest thing that I learned from the, the documentary and from my challenge is that the one-on-one -on -one speaking is the most important thing, and that process cost me $1,350 for the one month, because that's three hours a day times 30 days times $15 an hour, and it got really expensive really fast. Um, and whether someone who's learning Spanish uses us or doesn't um, is not my main concern. I think we're by far the best option. Um, but the most important thing is you, you really need to be speaking a lot. It's like that's got to be at least two-thirds, if not more, of your entire studying process. Because yes. um, if your goal is to actually be able to speak, you know, learning language is just like any other skill. So it needs to, you need to practice how you're actually going to use it, which is talking to people. Um, so, and for other languages, I would recommend, I generally don't recommend uh, language exchanges. And I'll explain, is you're doubling the amount of time it takes to get an hour of practice in your language. So if you've got a lot of time on your hands and no money, it can be okay, but they're not going to be, it's not going to be as good as with the teacher. Because, um, for, for instance, in English, why do we say big red house, not red a big house? Or what's the difference between may and might? There's a lot of things that we as native speakers can't explain. So it's going to be the same situation with an exchange. Um, that said, if you've got a lot of time and not a lot of money, it can work to get you that speaking practice. Um, but if you, depends on the per hour, for, for baseline, it breaks out to if you're spending uh, five months with us, it breaks out to uh, your savings per hour of doing an exchange, doing it for free versus doing it with us, is like $3 an hour, at which point you're better off getting a minimum wage job. So for a lot of people, even at a $15, $15 an hour for me, it still came out to, I would save like, nine dollars an hour or something like that of going with uh, an exchange. So it's like, okay, I can make more than that doing more work. So if it's my my goal is ultimately, you know, cheaper, you know, you you can ultimately work more and, and just use tutoring. Uh, whether sure. that's in Spanish as well. Or yeah. another language. We don't actually we I don't, I personally, I mean, of course, it depends on your financial situation, your time. If you have, right. as you said, if you have a lot of time, then then go for it, go find exchange. But there are a lot of things that there's a lot of disadvantages finding an exchange. You also, not only you, you you spend half an hour English and half an hour whatever language you're learning, you also need to mm -hmm. find time to find the right person, which takes a lot of time, a lot of requests, mm -hmm. a lot of going back and forth and trying different things, people out. So I highly mm -hmm. don't recommend I don't really, if you if you have if you have a little bit of money and because it and and to the the returns of, of what you get from from spending money on Baseling or whatever service that you use, it's mm -hmm. it's a lot better than than finding exchange button. But of course, depends again depends on how much That's, time you got. Exactly. Um, let's um, let's ask. And for let's, people, should we and ask for people? Yeah, go on. Go on sorry. Uh, the last. <laughs> sorry. Okay. For people actually learning Spanish. Um, the first week is a buck, so if you try it, you don't like it, you just quit and we'll even give you the buck back if you're unhappy. So, um, but, but I imagine most of the people here aren't, are learning a different language. So the, sort of the principles of using speaking as the majority of how you learn it, you know, stands across all languages. Does anybody in the audience have a question um, for Connor about baseline or anything else? Um, I do. Um, <clears throat> So originally, I was going to do this uh, challenge for Hebrew, um, mm. and that did not turn out well because I was just coming back from Italy, and I literally just spent three months doing actually more than three months doing Italian. 
Um, mm. And I just found myself not being ready to move on to a new language because I just didn't feel comfortable with the level that I was at. Mm. Um, I am considering doing Spanish for my next challenge. Um, obviously, um, as I've heard many people talk about, they've had difficulties in switching over because of uh, such closeness with Portuguese, with Italian, with French. Mm. Uh, getting everything right. mixed up. Um, the main answer that I've gotten to kind of combat that is just to stick through it and just still push through that period of mixing things up. Mm. Um, but I'm just kind of curious to get your perspective as a non-native speaker in Spanish. What were like the biggest pitfalls for you when you first started? Biggest pitfalls. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of false cognates, but it's not really the biggest pitfall. I think the, the tough thing for almost every language is understanding people when they speak really fast. Mm -hmm. um, once I got a handle on that, it was just a matter of adding words, of having the vocabulary, because I talk about really niche things, and I li like to be very articulate, so at that point, it's just adding lots of different words. So with like have, knowing Italian and English, you're going to have a lot of cognates and a lot of similarities that will speed up your learning process. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't speak any other language other than Spanish and English, so I can't say, but from what I've heard from talking to other people who do speak multiple languages that are similar, is that the pronunciation aspect uh, is important because you can sort of like have a different voice in your head for, for each language. Mm -hmm. um, as far as pitfalls, I'm not sure it's sort of like there are any specific pitfalls as much as just things that I need to work on if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Hey. Omar, do you have a question? Last chance. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, last question from uh, from a secret admirer. Do you have a, Do you have a girlfriend? Are you single? I am single, but I'm. Oh, Connor, single. But that might, that might be ending soon, so sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, single but not for long. Got it. All right, thank you so much, Connor. And if you guys want to, uh, so go to basing.com, check it out. It's, we heard a lot of great things about it. And um, if you're learning Spanish specifically. And the At One Challenge, yeah, so come check out the At One Challenge. We'd love to have you guys. Join us to learn a language and speak, be able to hold a 15-minute conversation in 90 days. And that's it. Thank you for having us. Thank you for, for joining us. All right. See you, everyone. See you, man. Bye.